But no, Pika, it's it's not a Christmas movie uh, per se. It's a movie set around Christmas. It's like um, Halloween by John Carpenter. It was a horror movie. But it would had the whole, like, you know, author's irony of being set on Halloween. <laughs> well, this Christmas is the backdrop of this particular horror story. And um, we've come a long way, baby. <laughs> that is a legitimate 70s feminist pun. That's from an advertisement. I grew up with aunties in the 70s. My mom and a single mom and uh, her sisters and my grandmother. So, and um, I grew up steeped in the 70s. And um, from Shout Factory's uh, Blu ray or. It's the official trailer. It's four minutes long, and I slowed it down 25%. To give us a backdrop. So you'll see... Uh, what is Black Christmas? It's a 1974 slasher film, and it's one of the original slasher films. Now, we can continue the argument of... When did slasher films begin? Was it 1960s... Psycho by Alfred Hitchcock made back in the Hayes Code era or was it the double whammy of 1974 Black Christmas and Toby Hooper's The Texas Chainsaw Massacre I'm here for that conversation let's Alan Z this is a Canadian production it was um Shot entirely in Toronto in 1974 on an estimated budget of $686,000. Its box office was $1.3 million. Canada. Okay. And um, it actually has an impressive cast. And um, it's also... Gosh... I think there's a lot to say about this 1974 in slasher films. I think there's a lot to it. Pardon me if there's like violent images behind me. That's This is only the trailer, too. But we're going to get there about feminism. Because this movie, is a, I feel, is a completely feminist movie. In a way. In a way, um, because, well, how? How could it be? It's that it objectifies, it victimizes, and um, here is the, this is the first kill, and this is the iconic death scene. So we'll just say it right out. There's very few death scenes in this movie. Well, there are, there are a couple. You know, there's just... But that's the iconic death scene. Is it the best best death scene? We always talk about best best death scene in these in these uh, horror movies uh, because they're they're staged and they're 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 parts of the story and they're they're meant to keep escalating, you know, deviousness, hideousness, evil, uh, the um, inventiveness, using what's around you. Um, you remember that name, Margot Kidder? She played Lois Lane. Such as this setup. You know, this that's the winch that pulls things up to the attic. You know? And it has a hook, a nice cast iron hook on it. So the killer just waited until the, the house mammy. Uh, that's a terrible thing to say, Lolly. John Saxon. John, as the police... John Saxon, who was the dad and the policeman in the original Nightmare on Elm Street. John Saxon, he's just he's got this great career. I, what a great actor. Um, you also have Olivia Hussey. You know her from uh, uh, the, the um, 
the, the 1960s version of Romeo and Juliet that everyone in high school probably saw. Um, and Keir Dulia. He, he was David Bowman in Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey. And Margot Kidder. Ooh. In the previous year, she was hot stuff. See, that is the iconic death scene. This is how we, we end the movie. This weird vision of a young woman silenced mid-speech. And then also the death of the matron, the caretaker. Not the crone, but the, but the mother, the matron. And how the unidentified first-person point of view, you know, unknown, heavy-breathing, dialogueless killer. You notice a trend now. This is a 1974 movie. This is kind of... And this sets up also the stock killings, special effects, bloodshed. The, these were some of the... I don't remember any nudity in this movie. I'll tell you that much. I don't remember any nudity... And when you say nudity in these movies, you always it's always presumed female nudity. To the, there's not much, you know. There's you know not much for the male form in contemporary cinema. I guess that helps contribute to the whole notion of male gaze and objectification of women. That everything is made, you know, you know, you didn't show enough, you know, swinging swinging manhood. <laughs> It's interesting what we cover up on statues as well. Uh, you know, the Greeks thought that the uh, the the flaccid penis with the the foreskin still low was not considered nudity. That your toga would go over your shoulders, but you know, you know your penis would basically be exposed unless it was erect and out of its foreskin. That was considered inappropriate. Standards, cultural standards, societal. Mores, agreements, we make to live next to each other. Ladies and gentlemen, John Saxon, the man. <laughs> hey, wasn't he and Mitchell? <laughs> this is the questions we ask ourselves. Um, and it's about hysteria, literal hysteria. Hyster being the like, you know one of the Greek suffix uh, prefixes. For, for the womanly things. H ester prefix. Meaning womb. Prefixes meaning uterus or hysteria. Yeah. Um, so hysteria literally means like a woman in such an emotional state that they that they, you know that they're in some kind of main they have a mania about something. They're focused. They can't you know break their concentration and they're in a um an emotional state and 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 a you know very you know what we, hysteria we know what hysteria is we also use words like crazy hysterical panic you know we, we use words all the time <laughs> but you know one by one the women of the sorority in 19 say this is to be said about 1972 1973 has to be said about set or set in 1974 you know it's set of its age college campus activism vietnam war feminism true second wave feminism where fem where male gaze came from was the arts and through those uh, those those disciplines and theories and how this and it's a I, I guess we have to presume it's a male killer because of size and strength the whole thing that we we always make fun of things today and like in, in our fictions where it comes to like you have this 95 pound petite woman in action scenes 
with 250 pound six foot men and we're supposed to have some kind of um suspension of disbelief well kind of you could i mean buffy the vampire slayer was exactly that kind of scale and i never questioned sarah michelle geller's authenticity or verism verisimilitude you know portraying buffy buffy ann summers to to kick ass super powered level and to heal super power quickly you know uh and um the call is coming from within the house so this plays on an old trope it was the old um it, it's called the babysitter and the man upstairs story it's an urban legend um and it's probably one of the most common horror story tropes and cliches that you you've heard of and it's uh it's called the babysitter story or the sitter is an urban legend i'm reading this you guessed it from the is an urban legend that dates back to the 1960s about a teenage girl babysitting children who receives telephone calls from a stalker who continually asks her to check the children. The basic story headline has been adapted a number of times in movies and, um, and the 1950 murder of teenage babysitter Janet Christman is commonly cited as a source for the legend. And there's also a, um, and, and there's also one where it's like, where are the phone calls coming from? They're coming from inside the house. Click. Hello. 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 Yeah, that's a, that's like the whole like setup and payoff thing. Yeah, um, that's that story. Yeah, this is that story. And so we have a house full of sorority girls. Who okay, think about it. Okay. Um I've also seen this before in Golden Age Wonder Woman comics, written from nineteen forty 1940 to nineteen forty eight, in its most original form. Uh Princess Diana of 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 of, of um, Themyscira is uh, moon is on is in America and she lives with a sorority at um a famous Ivy League college. And she goes on these adventures with uh, with the sorority girls. So the sorority girls get to live this huge, outrageous adventure, light, death defying, uh, harrowing experience in a safe space because they have a protector such as Wonder Woman. And they always come home safe and they're all single, beautiful, young, highly intelligent, highly motivated to get to college in the first place, like in the 1930s and 1940s. Well, here we only have like a generation or so after that. This is their babies and their daughters. And going to, to college meant coming across campus activism culture and also campus feminism. And that's where these academic things foment. And that's where these the soil where the seeds take purchase. Like, you know, there are really blue-collar things. I mean, these, these girls have left their blue-collar lives. They become young women at a university and they're in a, a sorority house living amongst each other in a sisterhood a, a, again a safe space boys can't come in after 9 p.m boys cannot stay over overnight usually you know this is like this is like this is from a, a a 20th century age you know and here we go once again the money shot that could be like the money shot because we come back to this in all three acts. We in Act 1 is her murder. Act 2 is we see her in the upstairs, especially in the attic. She's being stowed in the attic. And the um, the house mother um, goes up to the attic to go, go, go look for something. And um, that's where she gets you know, dispatched as well. And then by Act 3, the killer is in the house, moving around the house, killing the co-eds one by one, including Margot Kidder. Margot Kidder in the pre in the year before that, 1973, did a did a sizzling movie named Sisters, and it's got to show, you know, she got to show off her natural beauty and gifts. And so here in 1974, she's like, she looks a lot older in 1978. Sometimes I'm a little amazed at the, the way that cigarette smoking and just and lifestyle is like, you look at these older actors and you're like. 
Do you know that Margot Kidder was like 28 years old, 29 years old, when she played Lois Lane in Superman 1 in 1978? I thought she was in her early 30s. She looked so much older than, like, maybe it was makeup. I, no, I don't think so. I mean, it's just lifestyle. But, yeah, that's the, this is, the, the, this is the, the, the last shot of Black Christmas. So by the end of the movie, it's like, her boyfriend is looking for her. Her boyfriend's worried. You know what I mean? Uh, Olivia Hussey, she has a boyfriend. Olivia Hussey is the the lead. She played, um, and it's yeah, it's an unseen man, yeah. And and there's also someone calling the house with obscene phone calls, heavy breathing, and moaning, and and then then saying lewd things. So I guess that's how we can figure it's a man besides size, strength, voice, because. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't like, like, like techno, techno corn where we had like well, voice modulators, you know, the best you could get would be a, 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 a handkerchief over the, over the microphone. Hey, baby, you know, what's, what's, what you doing? Is it better your manicure not there? I see you. See, so that's how what you would have to do. I'm sorry if I scared you, Pika. No, 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 no. You're not getting phone calls like that anymore. Um, so Jess is played by Olivia Hussey, and she's that she's our hero. She's she's our final gal. So here we get we get final gal. Final gal could have also happened back in Psycho as well. Um, you know, um, so th that's why there's like a lot of leeway when it comes to what's the first slasher film. When did slasher films begin? And um, there's a conversation there. And this could be one of the first slasher films of the, especially the post Hayes Code age. The Hayes Code, once again, was uh, the morality clauses movies had to be filtered through to get distributed and, 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 put, on, and put in major movie houses. And, um, but by the late 60s, you had something an advent of the of the new aesthetic called New Hollywood, and um, groundbreaking uh, groundbreaking films like uh, such as um, Bonnie and Clyde with um, Warren Beatty and and Faye Dunaway, um, which is a magnificent one of the first post Hayes Code movies or the last of the Hayes Code. I might have to get this on Scream because I love Scream Factory. Blu-rays and DVDs. If I get one, I would get one for cheap, and you know, and you know, probably Texas Chainsaw Massacre, as well, or the original one. I've no. Now this has a legit uh, film series in 2016. Now this, the who owns this? Universal Pictures, and it's so in kind of universe rebootishness. It's. Um, Black Christmas had a 2016 and um no a 20 a 2006 and then a 2019 movie. So I hear that the, the 2006 movie is a straight up uh remake of this. Oh. That's good. Oh, here it is. Play the movie on crawl crawl sweetie it's the opening of the full movie and i just yeah i love it's an old movie it, it, it plays like an old movie it has three acts it's um it runs for 98 minutes so it's like three 33 minute acts but the one thing it's just about here we go i mean um feminist how how is this a feminist movie? Well, because this is about like as I said in that safe space with Wonder Woman, this is the opposite. This is a slasher movie. This is not a safe space, a subversion of the safe space of the sorority house, sending your girls to off to college, and also what would motivate the 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 the, the faceless killer, the moaner, the stalker to do this to 
young women. There's no, there was no setup payoff of jilted love or of, you know, it, it just didn't, unless I missed something. Um, it just seems to be just a random maniac as we like, to, as the faceless random maniac, the maniac of the story, you know, of the, the maniac of our dreams, the maniac of Crystal Lake, the maniac of, of, uh, of Illinois is there. Is, is it Sherwood, Illinois? I forget. Uh, it's so many places and so many maniacs. Uh, <laughs> this, these ones live inside of a Rubik's cube. So Claire is the girl that gets killed first. So you wonder if there's some kind of connection with her death and, you know, the killer. It, it really not. It's just more of just ma random maniac killer. It's, yeah, and it's... Um, but these young women, they're all in college. They're all of some level, even if you agree or disagree with each other as characters, for the most of it, they are all representative of of second gener of second wave feminism in a way. Seriously, I see this Academ academia. Academia represents that, and um, and this person objects to it and hates it so much that he'll end these people before they can become full fledged feminists. I don't see it as anti feminist because. Our last girl, our last gal, is is uh, is Jess, and played by Olivia Hussey. Her and her boyfriend. Her boyfriend is Peter. And he met, he factors in at the end, in the hysteria, and in the. There, there's a there's a twist, and then um, Jess has something to say to Peter. Confronts Peter. Peter, I am pregnant, and I'm using my choice in terminating the pregnancy. Of which Peter gets demonstrative, emotional, and basically kind of turns her off in a way, too, with his neediness and his insistence that she not that she carry through the pregnancy and that they get married and become and like do this the right way. But no, this is symbolic of doing it the new way. The feminist way. And this is... There's nothing more feminist than this argument. Pro-life, pro-choice. And... Um, so Claire's missing. She's in the attic, you morons. Go look up there. <laughs> and... Um, then one by one... Um, the girls start getting killed by the killer in the um, in the house, and um, Peter breaks through the window. Now, 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 by the end of the movie, the killer is chasing Jess around the house traditionally. Running downstairs, up and down stairs, opening up doors, finding dead bodies. There's blood. There's there there there's corpses. These are your loved ones and 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 sorority sisters. He's after you. You're gonna end up this way too, girl. Run, fight back. She kind of does. She she barricades herself in the basement, and then Peter comes over, and because he still needs to resolve his relationship issues with Jess. You know what I mean? It just, it's going to like, you know, so Peter, so Jess here is where this is, you know, they say that, you know, the, the end of a man's life is getting married, but also, so, so Jess has that, could do that to Peter or Jess thinks that Peter is the killer and he, he breaks into the, you know, he breaks into the, um, the, the basement to confront Jess again and uh, to change her mind and Jess beats Peter to death with with a fire poker and the police find uh, her barely conscious creating cradling Peter's body and the police think it was Peter they put Jess to bed 
and leave her alone in the house. And, um, and then the telephone rings and we hear a creaking from upstairs. Great ending. Um, cause it opens up with us coming to, you know, it's the holiday parties. All the girls are leaving for the holidays. There's only going to be a few girls stuck at, stuck at campus, uh, during Christmas time. Claire's father's coming to pick her up tomorrow. He's the first person that notices, you know, you know, What's wrong? She was, she's never late like that. She was looking forward to coming home. You know, she 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 ghosted me. And then the boyfriend shows up all angry like she ghosted me. The men show up concerned, "Where's my where's our girl? Where's my where's my girlfriend? Where's my daughter?" You know what I mean? What happened to her? Exactly. It, it's got its nuance. It has layers. It's shit to think about. It's through the lens of feminism. We can through, see the, through the lens of early 70s culture. And we can see it through the lens of something like the Vietnam War. Something I think this shares with uh, 1974's Toby Hooper's The Texas Chainsaw Massacre is this wanton de a dehumanizing dismemberment and uh, casual um, erasure of young people of North Americans against this faceless, nameless threat that hates them and uses them for their youth. There's some kind of... I. There's also that very big cultural lens as well. The Vietnam War. I saw that all over Texas Chainsaw Massacre by the end, and I just... I've never read that anywhere. So through the same lens perhaps you know yeah you had drafting people that were young people that were not allowed to go to college and to have this experience this life this fate to balance the young boys dying in the rice paddies of a of a of a rainy asian for a jungle we have here it's not that safe at home either And so a lot of this, too, is shown from this first-person point of view, too, from the camera. Um, and this gets played through horror movies. This is, like, this is one of the big horror movie, like, conceits. And um, th th this point of view, the first-person point of view. And, um, well, it must, it just saves on a lot of hassle. Like, you know, <laughs> setting up, you know, just, you know, just, no, 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 just... You don't have to worry about anything. Just worry about like what's going on. And <laughs> but but yeah. So this has been Black Christmas from 1974. It's one of the influential movies of slasher film genre, of the subgenre slasher films in horror movies. It's one of the. It's the great grandmother, because the great granddaddy. Has got to be the same year Texas Chainsaw Massacre for this post Hayes Code with the MPAA rating system and the levels of shocking gore, grotesque, nudity, sexuality, um, and themes and maturity. Something happened with 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 with, with horror movies around this this new Hollywood time as well. They kind of grew up a little bit now. They re will remain banal, adole puerile, adolescent, um, jejun, and, and, and immature. You know, I'm talking about mature. <laughs> but there are levels to films such as Black Christmas, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the original 1978 Halloween, Brian De Palma's 1976 Carrie, 1973's The Exorcist. Even, say, like 1970, is it 77's uh, Phantasm? When did Phantasm come out? <clears throat> we should have covered Phantasm. Phantasm. This is 1979. But that was hulky and kind of just and, and going for younger viewers. Hey, Ooh, that's right. It's over here. And uh, but Phantasm just you know, I will do Phantasm next year, but these early seventies 
horror films. They're, 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 they're a bit more than just Bela Lugosi and the cape and the eyes. You know, or Lon Chaney or Mummies or Hammer, Va- you know, the Hammer Frankensteins with Cushing uh, or the, um, the Hammer Draculas with Christopher Lee or just it was something else. There was a maturity. There is a level here that we can inspect and I can totally see it here. In Black Christmas from 1974, I can totally inspect this with a feminist lens. Now, I don't think, <clears throat> I don't think it's anti-feminist. I think it's indeed feminist. But that's what makes it a horror story. It's a horror story. It's a feminist horror story. It really is. Thank you so very much for tuning in today. We're doing the 31 Days of Halloween. That's right. You can call it the 31 Days of Horror, the 31 Day Horror Challenge, Shocktober, Hashtag, Octothorpe, however you want to frame that reference. I hope you're enjoying this this program and, and the series in general. And I'm looking forward to ending this in the next two days with a couple of Good films I've never seen, Hereditary before by Ari Aster. Bring it. And it's going to be my second viewing um, of Midsummer. Hopefully it's got some commentary tracks. I would be totally up for that. But this has been, yeah, the great-grandmother of slasher films and modern horror. 1974's Black Christmas may have flown under your radar. It did for me because as I'm doing taking notes and and, and building this show from the beginning when we started off doing slasher films. Black Christmas came up in every wiki. And I was ignorant of it. Also, 1974's... That's Margot Kidder. Beautiful woman. I think she was about 23 or 24 when filming this. And um, that Lois Lane, Right? And um, <laughs> it just starts off so innocently, yeah. And then it goes bad, yeah. And so, uh, but this is just introduced. Black Christmas was on every wiki I looked up for all of these older, the 70s horror films. And I was ignorant of it and hadn't seen it. I fixed that. I also, I don't have a jewel box for you. I don't have a case. Um, this was free with ads on Amazon Prime. And it's a rated R version too. So it was, it kept all the, all the nascent special effects alive and bloody. And, you know, all the horror, all the kill scenes were intact. I mean, Margot Kidder gets killed with a sculpture of a, of a, of a, a crystal unicorn that's turned into a, a, a piercing weapon. You know what I mean? Um, but it's got to be the um, it's got to be the iconic death of Claire, and then returning to her repose again as maybe a warning to feminists that this is this, or maybe you know, or just just there's some there's something to unpack with the image of Claire with the plastic bag over her head in the rocking chair, so much so that it was included as the money shot scene on the movie poster itself. Seriously. Um, and he, here she is, Olivia Hussey, Jess herself. Either she's fighting with Peter or it's the moaner. Once again, the call is coming from inside the house. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for tuning in. Please like, and subscribe. I would love to earn your subscription. Um, and um, please, Save me that seat next to you in the dark movie theater. 